is Max Gagliardi and we're live with another episode of Talk Energy. We're in guest Rory Johnston. Uh, just real quick, episode sponsored by Block Solutions. If you're interested in going to the mine, Blockware's got a ton of out there you can check out. Uh, if you go subscribe to their newsletter, uh, podcast, it's awesome. You can visit www.blockwishes.com. Er, uh, and that would help the channel if you're interested in it. They sell <coughs> basics, do hosting for the clients, and they've mined over a thousand Bitcoin in the Blockware pool. Uh, that's blockwishes.com. Energy. Rory, how are you? How you doing, Max? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. It's been crazy in the last couple months. I mean, really, this is crazy on the commodity side, oil and gas specifically. And just wanted to touch base with you. Uh, the last episode was popular and just felt like a guest that's so, you have your show on the pulse of what's going on. You've got a great newsletter for people that uh, haven't checked it out. It's called Commodity Context, which I named this episode uh, for people to go check out. It's awesome. And uh, Rory, what's just like out of the mind this morning? Uh, we've had some big moves this week. Uh, what are your thoughts at? Yeah, I mean, so this morning crude's popping hard again. Uh, we're back. WTI is back over, you know, last time I checked about uh, 102, 103 again. We got down almost towards 95 yesterday, uh, which was getting pretty dicey there, uh, which, which is funny, right? I mean, like thinking that 95 is considered dicey now. I think we, we've all gotten <laughs> used to crude over 100 bucks. Uh, but no, the volatility regime we've been trapped in really since Russia invaded Ukraine has been exceptional. Um, and I think what we're seeing, these massive moves up and down, like I think, you know, I, I think that oil should be higher than it was when it dropped. Uh, but even I, like, I mean, these giant, you know, massive jumps in the middle of the day aren't healthy i mean no one no one thinks that this like degree of volatility is healthy it's really you know the, the joke's always that volatility is good for journalists and analysts and no one else and traders i guess um but beyond that i mean like everyone else really just wants to know you know they'd rather have a reasonably steady price of crude whether that be as consumers or as producers so i think this is not great um either for supply incentives so i'm sure we'll talk about kind of you know where supply is coming from how is u.s shale going to accelerate how does u.s shale going to view a uh you know a sell-off like this um, i you know i joked on tuesday when crude dropped over ten dollars a barrel i think it was the third steepest intraday drop in history um i joked basically that you know i, I picture there being some kind of you know uh, oil executive team debating capex expansions and you know they're like oh maybe this is the moment and then you know some intern scampers in and says that you know we're, we're down below a hundred dollars and crude is down you know 12 bucks today and they just like throw the growth guy out the window and i think that is unfortunately what we're probably going to see here you know the an episode like like tuesday was so i think psychologically traumatizing for people that had been holding a fairly kind of structurally bullish view that I think it really does remind everyone of just how volatile and sensitive oil as a commodity is. And I think particularly the equities, because while oil got, you know, pummeled, uh, the equities got absolutely kind of obliterated uh, both both this week. And I think, again, over the past over the course of the past month, crude fell from uh, over $120 a barrel for WTI to 95. So that's a huge kind of uh, haircut. And yeah, it's been, the volatility has been wild and just trying to get a handle on it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And I think that for, like you mentioned, you know, the world of like, Twit, uh, you know, all the gas bulls that have popped up, it just, I started getting nervous because you get on Twitter and all of a sudden there's all these people now that are covering oil and gas or saying, you know, having all these takes and kind of like, I don't know, I've seen just of these. Uh, and we've got this one side where supply and demand is uh, arguably bullish in terms of the fundamentals. But then you have kind of this looming uh, potential recession. The Atlanta Fed said we are in a recession or we're going to be. And so it's kind of like on one side, you have the fundamentals and you think, okay, uh, we're going higher. But then on the other side, the economy is looking shaky, depending on the metrics you use. And to your point, the uncertainty, uh, it's huge for these companies because it's hard for them to grow given the mandates of investors and uh, and kind of, you know, away from these capital discipline plans. And then you get kind of tempted with $8 gas, natural gas, and uh, $100 oil. 
and then you can see move I have recently and it's a it's a serious world out there but uh one of, like fundamentals what are the things you're paying the most attention to on the supply and demand side right now for oil specifically yeah so i think what you know one thing that's interesting here is that so for the majority of the covid the majority of the pandemic period oil has been deeply deeply in supply deficit um obviously there was the record surplus at the beginning of of 2020 in april and kind of may uh that, that prompted you know the most voracious kind of buildup of inventories on record but then that was followed by almost 18 months of uninterrupted deficits and we saw and sizable kind of million to two million barrel a day deficits in the global market that drew those inventories down at a record pace and kind of well dropped well below where they started and kind of dropped back down towards that 2010 to 2014 range where i would consider you know the healthy oil market this is pre the 2014 collapse um in oil prices so you know we came back down really quickly so inventories are low but i think the, what's interesting as well is that you know demand this year has suffered and i think it's not necessarily you know i think it's still too early to see to say how much of that demand fall off is kind of economic and recessionary based versus what we know for a fact which is that china when it uh, you know locked down 60% plus of its economy for you know to maintain covid zero policies this past spring and that's still where the data is you know you know we're basically I'll be publishing my next monthly in 2 weeks and that'll be may data so the data has always lagged a little bit um, but the last data we know was that the market was actually reasonably oversupplied in april um, now i think oversupplied but in a deeply kind of deficit inventory position right so this is why it's interesting i think that what happened was the fundamentals kind of loosened sufficiently to allow some of that macro recessionary kind of bearishness to to kind of come in because there wasn't a fundamental driver uh, at that exact moment that said i think that you know everyone looking at or almost everyone uh, kind of looking at the market right now begins to get worried kind of further into the year when opec uh, kind of uh, contributions or kind of additions to their production balance you know when you know the the final return of the barrels they they dropped into the market in early 2020 to save the oil market that those returns are basically scheduled to end at the end of the summer uh, you know, at the same time, we're, you know, so that's whatever, 400,000 barrels a day, theoretically, right? I mean, they're not actually adding that, but, you know, some people are still building that into their into their models. Uh, and then you're also going to have the SPR uh, releases, which are basically going to peter out by the end of the summer as well. I mean, they were very much designed to take pressure off of balances during a driving season. But given the scale of that SPR release, and I generally think of SP, the SPR release as a kind of almost a discretionary source of supply rather than an inventory, because it, it's not going to passively drain. You need to make a decision for it to drain. Um, so that is going to turn off at the end of summer. And that's kind of a million to a million and a half barrels a day, which is, you know, a reasonably middle sized OPEC producer, honestly, just dropping out of the supply demand balances. So I think that that is when I started to get kind of more concerned on the supply side again for crude. And I think that we're going to probably see prices go higher into the end of the year, again, barring kind of a full-blown global catastrophic recession, which is, you know, all, all kind of bets off. And I think to your point around how to even think about a recession, I think is really important because it's not like, you know, if we look at the last kind of economic correction or recession, which was COVID, it would be awful. You know, we're going to lose 10 million barrels a day of demand. It's, you know, un, you know, uh, you know, staggering. But really, in most non-pandemic recessions, you know, really growth in oil either just slows or maybe plateaus for a moment. It doesn't usually contract outright. So I think it, it really is more of a a delaying rather than kind of a, a you know a net kind of rug pull if you will on on demand so i think it it pushes out the timeline slightly but doesn't fundamentally change it the only thing that's going to fundamentally change uh the kind of longer term trajectory of oil in my opinion is a material and sustained kind of behavior change in u.s shale producers away from cash flow and kind of investment discipline and towards at least some semblance of growth again you know, I think I think quite likely um, we will see some of that just as these supply chain bottlenecks kind of unwind in the in the patch, whether that's pipe or labor or sand or anything else. Um, so I think that will eventually happen. But 
you know, I think anyone watching the sector still understands that something has fundamentally changed in the appetite for investment in the space. So if that doesn't change, I think we do, we have entered a structurally tighter, uh, higher price environment for, for crude going forward. Yeah, I mean, price is always margin, right? And so these events, like you said, uh, are like the shutdown of the Chinese economy, COVID lockdowns, or the SPR, these can have material impacts, at least in the short term, on price. And it's been, you know, one of those things where, to your point, like the data we're looking at now is still has the COVID lockdown. We're still going to see the SPR data rolling through. And that's certainly having an impact on price, but long term, you know, uh, can add supply. So there's two the supply side I want to talk to here in a minute. But real quick, before we get into uh, the stuff, what about gasoline? We've seen the price come down to pump. Uh, you tweet a little bit about it. I just thought the U.S. gasoline uh, and diesel uh, markets, and, you know, are in for a bit of a reprieve here, a bit or just what thoughts on that market? Yeah, so my last kind of premium post I, I, I published at Commodity Context was on the refining bottleneck. And I think this is a, a particularly abnormal part of this energy crisis is that not only is crude trading at $120 a barrel or, you know, wherever it is at, at the given moment, um, which would already be enough for kind of concern, particularly from governments and consumers. But on top of that, you've had, you know, a generational. And again, I've been trying to find the right historical parallel for this, and I really haven't found it. I have never seen a refining crisis like we've seen, you know, this year, uh, yeah. where crack spreads are the difference between refined products and crude oil inputs have blown out for a product <laughs> like gasoline from a normal range of $15 a barrel, maybe $20 a barrel on a good year to 60 or more dollars a barrel. So not only so when you're, you know, at the pump, you're not just paying, you know, $120 equivalent for gasoline for, you know, in terms of oil, you're paying more like $180 a barrel, which is why I think it's particularly so kind of painful at the pump and why this has become such a, a priority of governments. I know the Biden administration has been looking deeply and tweeting deeply about lots of uh, lots of the refining side. But unfortunately, you know, while you know, the upstream is slow moving. The refining side is particularly slow moving. I think what you saw and kind of what I what I talked about in my piece was I, I described it as a collapsed bridge between the refining generations that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you were expecting a certain amount, uh, like before the pandemic hit, you were expecting a certain amount of capacity to come online. Um, and what COVID did was it kind of pushed out those in-service states. So anyone who was planning on bringing a refinery online in 2020 just basically didn't, because why would you? Why would you push through that to kind of try and supply fuel into a, a grossly kind of negative market? So those were pushed out. At the same time, all of those refineries, that, particularly in the United States, and this is where you saw the most you know, acute kind of loss of capacity, um, you know, a lot of these refineries are extremely old. There's a re there's a refinery in Houston that we're all watching as to when it's going to kind of, you know, finally kind of, uh, you know, call it quits. And it's over a cent it's over 100 years old. So this is wow. extremely old infrastructure, extremely expensive and kind of unappealing to maintain. Um, so what you saw in COVID was those retirements spiked well beyond what anyone was expecting. OPEC's annual report uh, has an interesting session on kind of expected changes in refinery capacity. In 2019, before the pandemic, they expected about 300,000 barrels a day of refining capacity retirements globally in 2020 and 2021. And we ended up getting 2.2 million. So you saw wow. a huge change in refining capacity. And then on top of that, you also saw the impacts of Russia because the, the main channel through which the sanctions have hit Russian exports has actually not been on the crude side. It has been on the product side. And it's been specifically for the kind of uh, for your hydrocarbon wonkier uh, kind of viewers. Um, it's, it's those intermediate semi-refined feedstock products like fuel oil or vacuum gas oil that had historically been exported at scale from Russia. And actually, a lot of it had ended up in U.S. refineries as a preferred alternative for Venezuelan, you know, product of a similar quality after that was sanctioned. Uh, so when you lost that, a lot of those, you know, refineries elsewhere really lost uh, a good chunk of their kind of finished fuels yield. So that combined with this collapsed bridge and combined finally with 
China has also ratcheted back refined product exports in, in its uh, kind of pursuit of net zero uh, kind of goals domestically. Um, so all that together means there's just way less, way less capa functional capacity in the refining market. Um, so that's what we've been watching. And I, I think I think it's still going to take probably six to nine months to really work itself out. I think it's just unfortunately a timing factor. But one thing that we saw very interestingly over the sell off over the last couple of days is you know the new the US Gulf Coast 321 crack spread uh, dropped from like $40 a barrel to $30 a barrel in two days. So we've lost 25% of the crack spread in two days. Now, I think all of this, as I was saying, is extremely volatile and who knows what's gonna stick. But I think maybe we could see some of that ease more quickly uh, than I had initially expected. And I think the market will always humble you. And I think that particularly with refining, it's it's an especially opaque market, even more opaque than upstream. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly what's happening. And crack spreads are going to be your biggest uh, your biggest clue. And those so far seem to be heading in the right direction right now. So hopefully a bit more kind of uh, pump price pain relief for kind of North American motorists soon here. Yeah. I'm getting messages that my quality is bad. Sorry, my internet's messing up. How is it? You hear me all right? Um, you, you are, a, you are a little, a little choppy on my end, but I can, I can hear and understand what you're asking. All right. I'll talk the important one. So, uh, what about shale supply you know, on that side? Yeah. So shale is interesting, right? I mean, this is, uh, also something we've been kind of, I've been following a lot at, uh, commodity context. The, the challenge there is all about this cash flow discipline, but also around this issue of, um, of these supply chain bottlenecks. And we've seen it most acutely in the, the uh, Dallas Fed has a survey that they do. And th what that showed, they actually asked people, where are the supply chain issues most acute? Um, and that has been mostly in you know pipe. Uh, so what they call oil, oil country tubular goods. Uh, so steel pipe has been in hard supply. Labor has been a hard thing to find, as is kind of equipment and kind of service capacity. So what you saw over the kind of period from 2014 through to now was a lot of oil field service companies that had been cut back to the bone in the downturn. A lot of these upstream EMPs had pushed a lot of that pain down the supply chain towards the oil field service companies to kind of figure out where you could rationalize costs at which step. And a lot of these companies to try and save money had been slowly cannibalizing their own, you know, pressure pumping and kind of whether it's drilling or, or completion and pressure pumping capacity, that's all been kind of coming down. Um, so now we're in this kind of pinch point where drilling is finally up. And I think we're finally going to see uh, one thing we've been watching for a while where the depletion of the duck inventory or the drilled but uncompleted wells. That I actually think in the next month or two, we're actually going to see it flip and we're going to see more. We're going to see ducks start to rise again as drilling out paces completions. The challenge, unfortunately, is that the completions are what actually makes the, you know, the production. So we really need those completions to accelerate more material than we, the, more materially than we've seen. And I think it still remains, I think everyone, everyone has really, really strong opinions as to what's happening in oil right now. It's why shale's doing what they're doing, et cetera. And I still think, well, we can kind of see the, you know, the shadows of, of truth as to what's really driving decision-making at the corporate level. I think, unfortunately, um, you know, it's still going to be too early to tell how much of this is true cash flow discipline and how many of how much of this is, you know, firms saying it's cash flow discipline when really they just can't get the equipment and service capacity they need. So I think as that bottleneck begins to ease on the service side, on the um, on the you know various supply chains, then we'll really begin to test this theory of of cash flow discipline because obviously 2020 and 2021 are pretty weird years along a whole host of metrics um, for you to kind of hang your hat up on this kind of cash flow discipline thesis. I still think it is one of, if not the, the biggest driver, but I think it's, you know, we don't know if it's 30%, 50% or more. Uh, and I think only time will tell as we begin to see those other supply chains ease. And, and so if you did want to, you could kind of, you could kind of drive that again. Yeah, definitely. Uh, what about the uh, OPEC side of the supply? Uh, equation. What's your thoughts on uh, rumors around capacity and just what do you see on that front? Yeah, I, you know, I think, you know, there's been rumors particularly around, you know, what Saudi Saudi Arabia's true spare capacity is for well before I entered the industry. I think, you know, there's the famous Matt Simmons book, Twilight in the Desert, that was published a solid decade before I entered the industry. 
So it's definitely been, you know, a question. Um, I at this, I mean, I don't know, frankly, and I don't think anyone really knows. I would say that my assumption right now is they have what they say they have, uh, which just to be clear, probably isn't going to be enough long term anyways, um, which I think is my big point is, you know, either it's it's really a question of timing. Either they have what they say they have and they can get there quickly when they need to, or they don't. And then that crisis just arrives a couple months, maybe four, six months earlier, because even then Saudi Arabia doesn't have all that much spare capacity. I think they claim to have, you know, 12 million barrels a day of capacity or so. Uh, so you, you have some additional capacity in the UAE that had been built up, honestly, over a lot of these OPEC curtailment periods. So we really haven't seen it in action yet. But beyond that, we know that, oh, that the rest of OPEC doesn't have anything. Um, it's really Saudi Arabia and UAE, and that's it. Um, obviously, the rest of the countries within OPEC uh, you know, are dealing with the same issues of underinvestment, supply chain bottlenecks, et cetera, as, as you know, the shale patch and elsewhere, and with even less capital invested. So you know, the classic examples within OPEC, the worst reformers are near Nigeria and Angola. And both those countries, if you look at if you look at the chart, they just kind of decline in a straight line. Like it's not really like it's it doesn't look like there's even any false starts and, and kind of moments of hope at, at, at this point. So I have seen there have been headlines that Nigeria is going to try and, you know, get its act together and pump more and kind of reach its OPEC quota by the end of the summer. But I'm, I'm deeply skeptical. Um, but again, anything can happen. I think the other interesting thing here is one of the one of the big talking points and one of the areas that I do think, because, again, I think it's the one thing my, my one disclaimer and preface here is we're in a we're in a crisis. Uh, governments, uh, you know, particularly the White House, are going to want to press any buttons they have under their control. They don't love hearing it's a timing issue. You have to wait. You know, that's not super popular. So they're going to want to know what discrete things they could do themselves to make the crisis easy to, to, to ease off on some of the pain of the crisis. And one of the areas that I think you could legitimately see relief that is purely under U.S. executive control is sanctions against, uh, sanctions against Venezuela. Um, and I think for two reasons. One, on if you lift sanctions, you will hopefully be able to get more overall supply. But also, you're going to see a lot more of this intermediate product. Again, I had mentioned at the beginning that when you know U.S. refineries started consuming more of this vacuum gas oil and fuel oil from Russia after the sanctions against Venezuela picked up, well, now that you don't have that product from Russia, well, could you go back to Venezuela? And I think there's this open question. Now, obviously, the Venezuelan regime is awful. Maduro is a terrible, terrible person. Um, and But I think it, it is all, unfortunately, a question of relative priorities. And right now, you know, Venezuela almost feels like a, like a quaint national security priority relative to what we're seeing in Russia, relative to what we're seeing kind of everywhere else. So I think that there could be signs there. And I saw a headline yesterday um, around, you know, potentially Chevron, which is a major operator in Venezuela, you know, historically, potentially making structural moves to prepare for these kinds of openings. So I think that is something that we could see over the next couple of months if this crisis persists and the kind of pressure, you know, uh, uh, keeps up on the White House. But I do think also like big sell offs like yesterday, while they're hugely deleterious to uh, investment uh, confidence of, you know, in the patch, I, I do think that, you know, Biden at all are probably going to have an opportunity here to say, ha, ah, look, we fixed it. They didn't. But, you know, I think, <laughs> you know, I, I think if they're blamed incorrectly for every upswing, I think that they can probably, you know, it, may, it might be fair to say, aha. We picked it, you know, we picked it on the downside. Um, but uh, but unfortunately, that's just politics. Uh, by the way, your uh, your your signal just became much, much better. Yeah, I knocked it from like stand. I had it at like 720p and I knocked it down to just like the lowest resolution that I could do. I don't know if that made it better or not. It works. It works much better now. OK, cool. I should have done that for you. Yeah, my office is having this thing with upload speeds like downloads fine. But for some reason, I feel like we've been getting throttled on upload like video calls and podcasts brutal. and stuff have been brutal. But um, cool. So as long as it's better, let me know if it's not and I'll yeah, talk it's less. Much better now. So yeah, it's interesting. I mean, your turn to talk now. Yeah, <laughs> I, you're on to talk. People get to hear me talk all the time if they listen to the show. Um, no, it's interesting. I think that the supply side is more complex and interesting than it used to be. I think it was always just kind of assumed that uh, the shale guys were just going to drill baby drill and that OPEC could, you know, had unlimited uh, ability to increase supply. And so it made for kind of a boring story. Uh, and it just seems to be getting uh, like a more interesting story, at least in this chapter of it, 
Uh, and, and, you know, this thing with Russia and long term, how that's going to play out, you know, and, and I want to talk about gas, natural gas and some other things here in a minute. But just like the Russia impact, are we still I mean, is the air just getting pushed around in the balloon? Are these guys still going to be able to, you know, export as much of these products and uh, and uh, oil as they had been just but maybe to other countries like uh, India and China or some of the east? Or is it a long term something i know you're probably not a geopolitical expert can't predict what the war is going to do but just your thoughts on russia in general right now and how they play into this yeah so i'm going to kind of go through my thinking of how i follow the russia impact uh and the one thing i will say here is uh, in the smarter the analysts i talk to the more they acknowledge we don't know what's going to happen in russia i think you know, already the kind of move, you know, the the massive drop and then the this apparent bounce pack that I'll talk about in a second have already caught a lot of people flat footed. Um, I think it's really, really hard to see exactly what's going on within Russia. We don't know how they're kind of increasing production again. We don't know if it's a healthy way. We don't know if they're just water flooding the crap out of their kind of assets. And, you know, this is a short, you know, sugar high followed by a big crash. No one knows. So I think that's the first preface. And with that under, with that kind of out of the way, I'm going to kind of walk through how I think about it, what has happened to date, where I think some of the confusion has arisen because the data is, is kind of very fuzzy and people are kind of latching on to little tiny fragments of the story and kind of running with them as a whole narrative. So I think my I wrote a piece a little while ago, uh, Oil's Russia-sized whole part two, um, and it was kind of an attempt to break down the major moving pieces of Russian liquid supply. So basically what that is, is you've got, you know, you've got domestic production of crude oil, you've got refining uh, and the amount that, you know, gets pushed of, of Russian crude through refineries into products. Some of that will get exported, some of that will get consumed domestically, and then some crude, whatever is left over, will get kind of exported uh, as well. So all that together, what we've seen is uh for the first thing to fall off was refining. So refining uh, runs fell off by, a mil- by about a million barrels a day in March. Mm. Uh, and that front run, the loss in uh, crude oil exports. So I think what happened was at first, it was really, really hard for Russian refineries to place and find buyers for some of these intermediate or semi-refined products fuel oil, vacuum gas oil, et cetera. That was the first thing. So what you saw was rather than kind of just refine this stuff and keep it on hand, those refineries went into extended maintenance periods. You lost about a million barrels a day of runs there. What I think you then saw was Russian domestic crude oil inventories completely glut. So all of that, all of that, you know, very, very quickly, it's hard to redirect these flows so quickly. So a lot of that ended up in inventory. And I think at that stage, you roughly likely at this stage don't have much Russian inventory left. So now everything that's produced needs to get exported. Um, You also saw some losses in Russian domestic demand for the fuels because of the recession that kind of followed on after the invasion and all the resultant uh, sanctions that were placed on Russia by the international community. So that was the first step. The second step was as all that got backed up, then then domestic production of crude oil fell by about a million barrels a day in April. But... What we've seen more recently is that everything is starting to pick back up again. And now, uh, as of mid-June, and I, th- and I think we still have the final numbers yet, but as of mid-June, it looked like Russia had retraced about 50% of its, of its uh, kind of production losses. So that's already kind of weird, because I think everyone had expected it to fall and stay f- and kind of stay down and then fall further. And the main rationale there was less and less area to put it and less and less Western uh, kind of oil field service expertise uh, to kind of uh, maintain the kind of integrity of the wells and the kind of production infrastructure. The other thing we've seen is one, one, I would say it's almost reached kind of meme level capacity is Russia is now exporting, quote, more crude than it was before. And I think the big challenge here is that, again, as I was saying, the data is very patchy and very kind of opaque. We, what we do see a lot of, and there have been a lot of companies over the last year or two, honestly, that have really gained steam. Um, you know, uh, two, you know, uh, uh, tanker trackers uh, is a great one, as is Kepler and Vortexa. Um, but they all specialize in tracking tankers and kind of seaborne shipments of this crude. And that's very transparent because you can see, you can see a tanker, you can track it in satellite, you can kind of estimate what's on it, etc. Tanker shipments have risen, but that's mostly because 
at least in the initial period, because you saw a massive draining of northern pipeline flows into Europe. So there wasn't more crude being exported necessarily. It was the same amount of crude. It was just going through a different avenue. Right. So I think this is the, the first thing that I see, and it's become my pet peeve through this crisis, is people saying, look, Russia's crude oil exports are up 25%. They, they can't be. The math doesn't make sense because right. you didn't. Now, that could happen now if production is bouncing back substantially and refining doesn't catch up. But again, it, it'll always be a balance between refining, domestic demand, and exports. It always has to be, arithmetically. So you, I think the best way to follow the Russia crisis is not always just focusing overwhelmingly on these tanker exports, but trying to wait and see what's really happening with all those other pieces, because I think that's where all the interesting dynamics are happening right now. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I just wonder, my, my biggest question, I mean, the short-term stuff is interesting if you're focused on price or if you're focused on investing and you want to know where the prices are going short-term. I'm just wondering longer term, does this reshape in some ways uh, the geopolitical landscape for energy supplies? I mean, I think the answer is yes, but yeah. just how and, you know, where, where are the wedges driven? I mean, certainly what we're seeing in mm -hmm. Europe with uh, natural gas supplies is uh it's becoming i mean it is a crisis at this point i mean i think i saw last night or today that they're already starting to try to ration people's gas usage and it's in july so um yeah. it's not i mean I'm, I'm not trying to make light of it it's a serious problem but it just seems like the map is going to be redrawn over time you know these things aren't quick right it's going to take to build this kind of infrastructure to redirect flows and to re shore up supply it takes years and billions of dollars but man it seems to be one of the bigger uh, kind of political or supply shakeups we've seen. I don't know what else you could compare it to. Maybe like, uh, you know, Venezuela and how they used to be such a big, you know, uh, provider and how they've now uh, become irrelevant. So I don't know, kind of one of those sort of pivotal shift moments where Russia's role in the world on the energy stage is just changing. And to me, it kind of seems like it's, it's dividing the world in East and West and the Western leaders uh, you know, have, a, you know, kind of these emissions mandates and these things that they're pushing for, whereas I feel like the East is acutely aware of how important uh, security of supply is, given the fragileness of some of these governments. And so, I don't know, it's just really interesting kind of macro shift that we're seeing. And outside of these short term flows and supply demand stuff, I just I'm very fascinated to see how this redraws the map. Yeah. So like, you know, big, big kind of, you know, galaxy brain takes, right? I think this is kind of this long term you know, who knows? But I think we can kind of start to kind of, you know, build a, build a narrative of kind of what seems plausible. And I think some of what you're saying, I think, is definitely true. I think already we've seen the appetite and capacity for India and China to offtake more Russian crude is already above what I think many, myself included, had expected could happen at least this quickly. Um, we still have yet to see how all of this will be affected by uh, the EU, US, and UK sanctions on shipping insurance. I think this is a mm. big wild card still that we, frankly, everyone I talk to is a different answer. Uh, so I don't think anyone really knows how it's going to work yet. Uh, you know, the the alternative is Chinese and Russian firms can self-insure the shipments. And, you know, who in Europe is going to actually, you know, let's say a European state doesn't recognize the insurance, but how are they going to stop a Russian tanker? Are they going to shoot it? Like it, you know, I think yeah. it becomes a game of, you know, chicken at that stage. But I also do think, though, that, you know, there's a big question of, like, is this, you know, eight-dimensional chess by Putin, re, you know, redrawing the geopolitical map? Or was this him really kind of, like, overstepping and yeah. kind of probably, again, bluffing and getting called on it in a really yeah. bad way? Because right. while oil, I think, is it's going to be hard enough to redirect, I think there's a very open question about how much tanker capacity to, uh, to redirect all of the flows from Europe into India and China. Huge questions. And it doesn't seem logistically simple, uh, let alone kind of easy. So I think it's so I think that's the first question. Gas is even harder. Uh, it's obviously right. much harder to export gas uh, by tanker. It's much easier through pipelines, and there's much more pipeline infrastructure built into Europe. So I think while supply security, I think, is definitely critical, and I think ever, I think particularly Europe is understanding this right now. I think there is also this this feeling of is Russian supply that secure? I think you know, like, was it really that secure to begin with? If it if it becomes this geopolitical weapon. Uh, with a country that has very, 
very obvious antithetical kind of uh, uh, geopolitical aims, let's say, at least in Eastern Europe to the rest of the West, is it really that security to begin with? And then the other side is demand security is really important here for Russia as well. Gas has always been, you know, Putin and, and his circle has always seen Gazprom in particular and gas exports to Europe as the key geopolitical kind of tool they have in their arsenal for ex extracting leverage over Europe. And I worry that this was the kind of them kind of just like, you know, taking it and, you know, using using their one or, you know, one or two shot here. You know, we already saw it in in Crimea and then, um, you know, subsequently now there's you know, massive moves to either redirect uh, LNG flows uh, from the US into Europe or for Europe more broadly to kind of diversify away from from gas. Uh, kind of consumption as the major thing. There's, you know, Marshall Plan for for heat pumps and all these other things that I think could really move to kind of crush demand for Russian gas in Europe, which fundamentally, structurally weakens Moscow's hand in those relations. Um, I, 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 you know, as you were saying it, I was thinking about these kind of geopolitical realignment moments. And the only thing that can really come to mind very quickly for me about the potential kind of demand destructive acceleration we see for Russian gas in particular, you know, it, it feels almost like the 1970s uh, and the West with oil. You know, before that, you know, everyone, you know, lots of places were still burning oil for electricity. This was pre the big build out of nuclear, you know, and what we're seeing in Europe right now, a re-embrace of nuclear, a re-embrace of all these alternatives that had for a long time kind of been inconveniently anathema to the kind of broader green mission, now being embraced as a kind of a necessary alternative to the you know evil fossil gas of Russia, and I think this is this kind of moment where I do worry. You know, I, sorry, I, I think it's a good thing. I think I I'd be worried if I was Moscow about the degree to which that you know really I was saying earlier you don't normally see a lot of demand of uh, oil demand destruction in a recession. You did in the 70s because there was a lot of low hanging fruit of kind of potential for switching, and I think that is true as well in Europe. I think that anyone that was looking at starting a new facility or starting a new power plant and thinking, hmm, gas seems cheap and safe. Well, I don't think anyone is thinking that anymore. So I think that that's bound to have a behavioral kind of consequence and, and change investment behavior. Now, I think it's going to take a long time and a lot of effort. And I think we maybe we haven't seen the kind of clear headedness from Brussels and the rest of Europe that we would kind of hope in a crisis like this. But I think they're at least pointing in the right direction, which is Russian gas supply is not reliable. Um, we probably need to diversify away, at least at least from a sense that it, it reduces the leverage that Moscow has. And I think that's what we're seeing today. Yeah, definitely. Well, it's interesting you brought up the shipping insurance. I don't know if you've read, I'm reading like uh, Peter Zeehan's new book and he kind of looks at- like, I haven't read it yet, but I want to. He has like a chapter on uh, the shipping insurance and he says that's kind of like the linchpin. A lot of his arguments kind of revolve around how the shipping in general, shipping lanes and just security around shipping. And he uses like the Iran-Iraq escalation and- some of the ships that were uh, shot down, I believe, or uh, attacked, I believe that was in the 90s. I can't remember exactly when that was. But yep. he uh, says that, you know, at the time, insurance companies would have all gone bankrupt because they, it's just so expensive to replace these ships. And historically, the, the odds are, you know, when you have the uh, statisticians or whatever they're called for insurance companies, I can't remember. Uh, actuaries. Act actuaries, that's right. <laughs> when you have the actuaries that are doing this. Uh, they don't, you know, the odds of like multiple ships getting destroyed, it's usually pretty safe. And so there's just not enough reserves in these insurance companies to cover uh, ships getting attacked. But but honestly, though, there's a little bit of conspiracy there, too, because, I mean, how many like hot wars are going to get started? Like, I don't, I don't know. To your point, number one, some sovereigns could probably insure these. And number two, it's like it's a pretty high escalation. If people are going to start like bombing, you know, Russian ships, uh, they're yeah. nuclear power. So it's kind of like, yeah. Um, but real quick, so we don't have a ton of time. I uh, not gas. I mean, the story it's collapsed recently. It was at ridiculously, I would say, ridiculously high levels. Is it just as simple as the narrative of LNG, or is there other underlying uh, storylines there that we need to pay attention to? Yeah. So first disclaimer: I'm definitely I'm more of an oil guy than a gas guy. So my yeah. my the depth of my expertise kind of wanes here a little bit. But I do think that you know the big trigger there was obviously the outage at Freeport. Yeah. Um, right. And and I do think that that does. It explains at least the kind of change in directional momentum. And I do think that some of it was likely being momentum driven at some stage, people kind of jumping on that wagon. And as that changed, it kind of came back down to earth or at least kind of deflated that bubble, right, if you want to, right. if you want to call it that. 
but I do think again that you know gas is similar to oil and that like you know I don't think anyone was saying nine dollar gas was kind of the new normal. But if you if if four fifty gas becomes the new normal or five dollar gas becomes the new normal, that's you know double huge. <laughs> that's yeah. double the normal of before. And I think it's the same thing with oil. I don't think anyone's thinking necessarily that two you know one hundred and fifty two hundred two hundred dollar oil are the new are the new normal. But I think that bef- you know the shale band used to be forty to sixty dollar crude, and now it's probably more like you know eighty to one twenty crude, and that's a huge difference. And I think right. that's the same thing with gas here is that. As we continue to build out the, as and I say we, I am Canadian. As the U.S. continues to build out uh, kind of uh, LNG infrastructure, and Canada does as well on the West Coast, and now potentially even on the East Coast, hmm. um, that I think will 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 structurally bid, um, you know, North American gas in a way that historically it hasn't. And I think that does, you know, cheap gas and cheap and stable gas in particular is a demand creator. And I think that's what we saw. We, at first, we at one point thought there was going to be a huge amount of kind of reshoring. And we've seen some of that of kind of manufacturing and petrochemical facilities. But I think also now, I think LNG is a huge kind of, you know, it, it, it's experiencing renaissance. I, I, the, when I entered the, the industry kind of a decade ago, the, um, the talk at that moment was around LNG imports. And then it switched to exports and then the industry died and then it was reborn and, you know, you know, up and down and back and forth. But I do think that, you know, this point you were saying about Russia and this kind of new geopolitical norm, I think North American energy exports, both oil and gas, play an additional kind of, uh, you know, ally security role or at least a way because it's never a direct competition. But I do think the larger a role, call it free molecules or however you want to define it um kind of uh constitute in the global balance i think that's a that's a more secure environment for canada and the united states and the rest of our nato allies um and i do think that that's going to continue so i do think that that's going to continue to kind of add a structural bid to gas and hopefully we can get even more capacity online to kind of uh increase our kind of relative share because a lot of particularly in canada there's a lot of gas supplies that really haven't been developed because there's not an economical egress option. Well, LNG theoretically changes that. So I think, you know, as we get this infrastructure built up, and I do think governments are going to need to play a larger role in this because it's really, really hard to build stuff right now, given all of the various gatekeeper points and potential court challenges and lack of appetite for investment from the sector. Uh, so I do think that governments are going to need to play a role in that more actively. But I think that for the first time in a long time, Western governments and even Western governments of the progressive tilt are seeing, you know, oil and gas supply as a kind of a positive in a way they haven't for my entire time in industry. And I think that's really interesting. And I think we, we, I, I think that we'll be surprised at the ways that's going to change kind of policy preferences over the coming, <laughs> over the coming five years. I mean, I think I, I echo all that. And I think that the, I'm just a long term, more bullish probably than I've ever been on natural gas, not necessarily price bullish, but just bullish on the on the commodity and its role on, in the world. I mean, if the, the things that we can do with that gas, we have so much of it. It's so much easier to extract. Yes, it's a little harder to transport um, and store. But man, we have a ton of it. It can. It's just such a great resource. We make a ton of things out of it with the petrochemical complex. If you know what comes out of this Russian conflict is that Europe and uh, and America, Canada become more intertwined through uh, natural gas. I think long term, that's just a positive for geopolitical stability around the world, and also positive for our industry because I think that floor continues to creep up. You know, I don't think big swings to eight bucks, 10 bucks or whatever are healthy, but like, you know, a gradually increasing floor over time, uh, I think is a good thing. It's healthy. It allows more development and producers can actually make money uh, versus some of the last decade. So um, really bullish long term that gas. But Rory, I apologize. I got to run. I'm glad we got to uh, fit this in. I'd love to do it again sometime. It's always fun. man. Absolutely. I love your takes. Everybody go subscribe to the uh, Commodity Context newsletter. And what are your final thoughts here? Yeah, I think it's I think it's going to be an exciting. I think it's a really really exciting moment in the industry. I think the volatility is not great for anyone except for you know analysts like myself. But I do think that hopefully what comes out of this, as I was saying, even progressive governments in the West are beginning to kind of look at uh, oil and gas supply, look at nuclear capacity as in a way that they haven't in, in a very very long time, arguably since the 1970s. 
And I think that is a positive development in this kind of um, incremental and, you know, uh, compromise solution, if you will. I think the worst thing about the energy transition debate is the intransigence. I would like us to move towards a more secure, gradually greener or, or, or less emissions intensive, you know, uh, economy. But I don't want to see these big lurches in, you know, um, you know, jump forward in, in kind of regulatory authority, you know, pull back and jump forward. And we didn't talk about, let's say, the Supreme Court's changes to regulatory mm -hmm. authority in the states. But I think all of these things, I think I want to see more stability in the outlook. And I, and I hope that that is something that we're going to get with this gradually. Uh, and I'm pretty optimistic. I think so too. It needs to be, I mean, <laughs> the word transition, I think often gets lost. It's uh, they want to just turn things off and on. That's not how it works. It's got to be efficient. It's got to be deflationary and it's got to be secure. Rory, thanks again. Uh, it's been great. Hopefully we can do it again soon and uh, good luck with the newsletter. I think it's, it's been great from uh, what I've seen of it. So uh, thanks, man. Thanks for coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Max.